Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Ellen Zhang. Thank you for joining the East Asia Center speaker series on this um, wet and a little uh, gloomy Friday afternoon. And our speaker today is Dr. Yuan Julian Chen. Um, Dr. Chen is currently the Franklin Humanities Fellow at Duke University's Global Asia Initiative and John, and John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute. She received her PhD from the Department of History at Yale University and taught at Boston College before joining Duke. Her current research focuses on the history of environment in pre-modern and early modern East Asia. Her book, tentatively entitled Kaifeng, What It Took to Feed, Furnish, and Fortify the World's Largest City, 960 to 1127, will be published by Oxford University Press. She has also published multiple articles and is currently working on several projects, including book chapters for Bloomberry's sixth volume, A Cultural History of the Environment and Wiley Blackwell's Companion to Global Environmental History. She speaks Chinese and Japanese and reads classical Chinese and Tangut. Uh, Dr. Chen's uh, talk is entitled Kaifeng's Rise, Fall, and Ecological Legacy. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Chen. Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you, Professor Zhang, for inviting me to speak at the East Asian Center at the University of Virginia. Uh, and thank you all for attending my talk virtually, even though I'm not able to uh, see this uh, the, the attendees list because this is a webinar. Um, so Professor Zhang mentions that uh, most of the attendees should be students in her two Chinese history classes. Um, so I assume this is not the first time that you know the audience hear about the city named Kaifeng. Okay. So there is this Kaifeng, and this is a satellite image. Uh, I highlighted the rivers. I mean, I uh, enlarged the, the, the shape of the rivers on the map. So, and you can see Kaifeng is along the Yellow River, but not exactly, and I will explain why. So uh, first about Kaifeng, as I mentioned that I think most of you uh, in Professor Zhang's Chinese history classes have heard of the name. But when I speak to people outside of academia, when I speak of people, you know, uh, even out of, uh, outside of the China field, even if he or she is a historian, um, that, you know, if I tell them I'm working on the book on Kaifeng, most of them confess that they have no idea what I'm talking about. And uh, to save myself from some embarrassment, at some point, I started to tell people that I'm working on a book about medieval China's imperial capital. And this shift of wording actually led to some quite interesting responses from people. In my impression, most people would say, oh, so you're writing about Beijing, imperial capital. And others uh, probably who have traveled to China and saw the magnificent terracotta army, they would say, oh, you mean Xi'an? Or you know, some more knowledgeable people would even use Xi'an's historical name, Chang'an. And that's very impressive to me already. But very few, if um, anybody at all, have heard of Kaifeng, which was actually the link between Chang'an and Beijing, both geographically and chronologically in the succession of royal capitals in China. So Kaifeng served as the main or satellite capital of the Chinese empire on and off for about three centuries in the medieval period. And most prominently, it was the capital of the Northern Song from the mid 10th to uh, the early 12th centuries. At its peak, the, Kai, uh, the population of Kaifeng reached 1.5 million. And this was uh, much higher than contemporary water cities. I'm showing you the comparison of the populations of Kaifeng and other well-known large cities uh, in the medieval world. And we can see that Kaifeng was undoubtedly the largest in population on com uh, as compared with, for example, Constantinople and Baghdad and even Cairo, um, which medieval historians are more familiar with in the West. Um, so how come people don't really know about this um, populous city, such as a splendid medieval capital? 
And uh, that contrast between the city's glorious past and its um, obscurity today, let's put it this way, was one of the inspirations for me to write a book about this mystery. I want to take a step back uh, in chronology and show you this map of the Tang Dynasty. Uh, if we want to understand the rise of Kaifeng or how it became the capital of China in the first place, we need to first to find out why its success, its predecessor Chang'an was abandoned as a dynastic capital. You have probably heard of this historian's joke that, you know, when you want to write a book about the 18th century, you find your first draft is entirely about the 17th century. So I hope that's not the case for my book. And I don't plan to spend half of the talk uh, on Chang'an either. Uh, but still, the story uh, about the rise of Kaifeng is inseparable from the story of the decline of Chang'an. Uh, which was the capital of the Tang Dynasty that ruled over China for nearly 300 years from the 7th to the 10th centuries. The geography of Chang'an is ideal for capital building in a number of ways. Since as early as the spring and autumn period documents, the Trinqiu, um, brilliant philosophers and also politicians, they had proposed various theories um, on what makes the capital great. And one of them, Guan Zhong, um, he wrote, an ideal capital should be built by the mountains and along the rivers. Um, mountains can provide many things such as wood, uh, which can be used for various kinds of constructions and also for firewood and charcoal. And mountains can also provide natural fortification against enemy attacks. Um, and we can see from this terrain map that Chang'an obviously fits into this criterion. It was uh, surrounded by three mountains or three mountain ranges on three sides. So these three mountain ranges are the Qingling Mountains in the south, the Long Mountains in the west, and the Lowest Plateau in the north. The only open direction uh, was the east. And that was why Chang'an had been very resistant to invasions throughout the centuries. Um, when the attacks came from, you know, the west, the south, or the north. One of the famous examples was, you know, during the Three Kingdoms, the Sanguo period, um, you know, launched from Sichuan to the south of Chang'an, Zhuge Liang's failed attempt or attempts to capture Chang'an had been futile, largely because of the geographical fortification provided by Chang'an's mountainous geography or topography. But on the other hand, if the attack came from the east, the city was much more vulnerable. And the example of successful capture of Chang'an was the Anlushan Rebellion of uh, 755. And the Anlushan Rebellion wiped out two thirds of the population in North China. Most of them perished and some of them managed to migrate to South China and settled there ever since. And now let's, uh, let's add rivers to the map. So rivers are obviously crucial to any cities. They provide access to ir irrigation, uh, which is important for agriculture and also for providing domestic water. Waterways also provide convenient means of transportation. Chang'an was situated um, along the Wei River, which is a major tributary to the Yellow River. The Wei River connected Chang'an to the Yellow River and from there, it was further connected to the eastern parts of the empire. However, water transportation through the Wei River became increasingly difficult. And uh, that was because of deforestation. If you remember what I just mentioned, the three mountain ranges surrounding Chang'an were Qingling Mountains, Long Mountains, and the Lowest Plateau. All these three mountain ranges, they have suffered from deforestation. But the causes of deforestation and its consequences were different. In the case of the Qingling Mountains and the Long Mountains, the main drive for deforestation is the continuous demand for wood, or especially for construction wood. Both mountain ranges are among the richest woodlands reserve in China, but they have been heavily logged for building palaces and so forth. The Lowest Plateau was deforested for different reason. As the name indicates, the Lowest Plateau is made of Lowest, 
which was ideal for agriculture. So since very early settlement in the region, people have been clearing for trees on the plateau to make arable lands. But intensive cultivation significantly destroyed this uh, vegetation cover and caused the soil erosion. And as a result, huge quantities of loess were deposited into the Yellow River, making the water yellow. And the Wei River was one of the most clogged, most muddy tributaries of the Yellow River. So Chang'an was trapped by its own ideal geography and environment. It was blessed with rich agricultural lands, grasslands, and woodlands. That was crucial to support a growing population for many, many centuries. But when population growth reached the point that the local production could no longer support its population, it had to transport uh, resources, especially grain um, and other foodstuff from other productive regions uh, in the empire. And in the Tang Dynasty, the most productive regions of the empire already shifted from the north to the south, um, especially the Jiangnan regions uh, in South China. But at the same time, deforestation, which I just talked about, um, that came about uh, with the grow, growing population and the population's growing demand for arable lands caused the clogging of its major waterways. And we can see the great distance between Chang'an and Jiangnan. Um, it was already very tough to transport large quantities of food from Jiangnan to Chang'an, not to mention when the Wei River was uh, super clogged for most of the time. And now I want to talk a little bit about Luoyang, uh, which was also shown on the map on the slide. Uh, Luoyang is uh, located approximately 400 kilometers to the east of Chang'an, uh, and it's located in present-day Henan province. Luoyang was the eastern capital of the Tang Dynasty, but the court of the Tang actually spent half or even more than half of its time in Luoyang, and that was purely because it was slightly easier to access food transportation. But even Luoyang was not convenient enough for continuous large scale long distance transportation. And that finally brings us to Kaifeng where the Song Dynasty chose to build its capital city. Uh, let's look at this, yeah. So I always tell people that Kaifeng is the medieval Manhattan. Uh, I lived in Manhattan for the longest and the, probably the best part of my adult life. When I walked down the Fifth Avenue and when I biked along the Hudson River, I always imagine what it was like to live in Kaifeng a thousand years ago. And uh, here are the city plans of Kaifeng and uh, wait a second, I should have Manhattan plan. Yeah, and Manhattan side by side. And the two cities have about the same area and the same population. And they also uh, are similar in terms of wealth and prosperity. And the keystone of Kaifeng's prosperity uh, was the uh, blue lines on the city plan. And they symbolize the four canals that ran through Kaifeng. I reversed it. Yeah, so these canals were the bloodlines of the city um, as they connected Kaifeng with the rest of the world. And that included the productive agricultural regions um, in Shandong Peninsula and also Jiangnan in South China. And let's uh, zoom in. And in addition to these canals, uh, many other routes, man-made or natural, also connected Kaifeng with the rest of the world. Uh, if we zoom out, we can see that like all roads led to Rome, all roads also led to Kaifeng. It was a center of an expansive transportation network of both overland and uh, waterways. And uh, by the way, I want to mention that when I draw this map, I relied heavily on uh, one of Professor Zhang's map in her travel book. You know, you made a, you made a map of all those uh, Yijian. Um, so the coverage of this network was unprecedented in Chinese history. Um, so was its transportation capacity. This network not only provided physical connections, but also established profound economic and ecological connections between Kaifeng and the world. 
because the city's 1.5 million population, they demanded a tremendous amount of commodities. They needed food, uh, they needed food for their place, they needed timber to build their houses, they needed to burn coal in the winter, and they needed silk and the wool for clothing. And these commodities came from an expansive geography and from um, a diversity of ecosystems. These connections made Kaifeng prosper. Uh, I guess Professor Zhang has probably showed you this scroll painting in your class. Uh, this is Qingming Shanghe Tu, or the Qingming scroll for short. This amazing scroll shows an idealized Song Dynasty city with a vibrant commerce and no poverty. And many people believe it depicts Kaifeng. In many ways, what the scroll shows resembles our modern life in big cities. You can see that we have crowded streets and there are street vendors and the restaurants. Um, and uh, I'm, I assume you can hear more about the scroll from Professor John uh, in your classroom. So I won't dive too much uh, into its details, but I just want to use this as a lens to envision the Song Dynasty and its prosperity. Let's see. Um, so if you pick up um, a Chinese history textbook from any middle school or high school in China, you will probably read that the Song Dynasty was a weak dynasty, Jiping, uh, Jiruo, poor and weak. But here in the West, scholars see uh, this so-called weak dynasty uh, in a very different light. So it was an age of revolutionary breakthroughs um, in many areas, such as science, such as technology, and also in industry and even in finance. So um, in terms of finance, uh, what I'm showing you here is the first paper money in world history. It was invented by uh, a group of private banks in Sichuan in Southwest China to facilitate long distance trade. It was convenient and definitely uh, a major invention in the history of world finance. And the emergence of paper money also shows how prosperous the commerce was in China at the time, and also how expansive the trade network was in the Song Dynasty, because that is uh, why they made, they made the paper money, because otherwise, if you carry coins, copper coins or iron coins and or silver, they were all too expensive. But the paper money was very convenient if you have bulk trade over long distance. And uh, some scholars also call the Song Dynasty China's um, early industrial revolution. And without steam engines or electricity, this early industrial revolution in China was powered by wood and coal. Iron production in this period was extremely high as iron was widely used to make weapons, to make armors, to make tools, and to also to build architecture. In the, late, in the late 11th century, uh, iron production in China exceeded 125,000 tons. And to put this number in perspective, iron production in all countries in West Europe combined did not reach such a level until the late 17th century. And the photo here shows an iron pagoda in Shandong province constructed in the early 12th century. It is a rare survived example of how iron was used in the Song Dynasty. And let's come back to Jiping Jiruo or poor and weak. So the rise in commerce and industry couldn't be further away from poverty. And the Song Dynasty had the richest government in the history of Imperial China. And a prosperous commerce is a sign that wealth was not a state monopoly, but also circulated in markets and belonged to the people. But what about weak? So people label the Song Dynasty as weak, mostly because uh, of its political territory. Um, it was much smaller compared with the Han Dynasty and the Tang Dynasty. However, if we look beyond the lens of political history, I find the ecological outreach of the Song Dynasty much bigger than earlier dynasties, including the Han, including the Tang, uh, which claimed much larger political boundaries. And the Song Dynasty, was not a military empire like the Tang. The Tang influenced, uh, influenced its protectors in the Northwest and the North uh, through military deterrence. But the Song Dynasty's empire based in Kaifeng was commercial and ecological in essence. 
as much as the town was big, it could not effectively access resources in the far-flung parts within its own territory because of less developed transportation. But the Song was able to do so, and it was uh, also able to influence the economy and ecology of outside of its borders through trade and finance. And in other words, if we evaluate the Song Dynasty's real influence in its neighbors, it was actually more profound than what the Tang Dynasty or the Han Dynasty had, even though the Han and Tang claimed larger political borders or territories. In this way, the Song was a very modern country. Um, the United States is also um, a military empire as well as a commercial or business empire. But you know, remember before World War II, the United States was very content being just a commercial empire only with very little uh, military ambition. So if we evaluate the Song Dynasty this way, uh, can we still confidently or justifiably call it weak? And I highly doubt it. I will give you uh, two examples of how the Song affected ecologies and economies in distance lands through commerce. People in Kaifeng loved lamb, and they consumed sheep in massive quantities every year. The highest grade sheep came from Song's neighbors in Xixia uh, in the northwest and the Liao in the north. Large quantities of sheep and uh, other livestock animals were mostly transported to Kaifeng by land routes. The border markets on the Song and Liao border and the Song Xixia border, uh, where the sheep transaction took place, were about 600,000, uh, sorry, 600 or 700 uh, miles away from Kaifeng. Despite this great distance, people still purchase sheep from Xixia and Liao in massive quantities. I did a rough calculation. In Xixia, for example, to sustain a constant annual supply for the sheep trade with the Song government, they needed to dedicate grasslands as large as 25,000 football fields or 400,000 acres. And that was a quarter of their most fertile oasis. And imagine the actual burden on their grasslands if we consider other livestock trades such as cattle, camel, and horses, and let's also don't forget about non-governmental trade and also smuggling. So everything considered to support the Song people's consumption, the actual area of grasslands uh, the nomads had to set aside was much, much bigger. And overgrazing, among other factors, contributes to soil erosion and desertification. And this is a photo taken in present day Inner Mongolia. This used to be the territory of the Liao Empire 1,000 years ago. And now, nomads there still graze large flocks of sheep uh, and other livestock animals. But look at the barren lands, and as shown in these photos. The Song period was a watershed in this environmental change. Grasslands are shrinking, and the deserts have been expanding in the Mongolian steppe and the upper section of the Yellow River, where the Liao and Xixia governed a thousand years ago. And when the foodies in Kaifeng ate yummy lamb dishes, or when scholars in Kaifeng wrote beautiful poems about their fancy lamb eating experiences, I doubt if they realized what they were doing had a real impact on ecologists far, far away. Another example of Kaifeng's far-flung ecology, uh, ecological influence, was its wood consumption. Wood was widely used in uh, construction, energy, and shipbuilding in the Song Dynasty. It was also heavily used in making wood blocks, ink, paper, and brushes, which were all in very high demand in the age of literacy and mass printing. It was no exaggeration to say that wood powered the economy and industry of the entire Song Dynasty. This is a timber geography of the Song Dynasty court. The emperors demanded the highest quality um, and the finest and the largest timber from old growth mountains forest in the Northwest and in the South. Although the Northwest had been frequently logged regions, as I mentioned earlier, when I introduced about Chang'an, the Qingling Mountains and the Long Mountains, um, you know, have been very heavily logged ever since Chang'an was made a dynastic capital. And um, so in the Song, the 
uh, the virgin forests in South China became the new targets uh, of the Song court. So that's for the first time in um, the uh, in Chinese history that the central government in the capital city acquired timber from mountains in South China in significant quantities. Such long distance resource acquisition introduced many new wood species to Kaifeng, and these species were unheard of in North China before the Song Dynasty. Some of the southern species turned out to be really good in shipbuilding and construction. This is 11th century illustration of a type of ship called Lao Chuan or tower ship. It's a very advanced Navy vessel at the time. I, I think you can even call it the carrier of the medieval world. A modern aircraft carrier carry airplanes and the tower ship of the Song Dynasty carried horses and chariots because it was large and sturdy enough for horses and chariots to run on the deck. And it was made of a wood species called Nanmu, uh, which was native only to South China. Northerners had never seen Nanmu before. So when they saw the tower ship in a man-made lake in Kaifeng, they were really amazed. Such massive scale exploitation uh, led to noticeable deforestation and uh, long distance ecological influence of Kaifeng did not es escape the eyes of some Song scholar officials and who were very uh, really forward looking and forward thinking. And uh, one of the Song dynasty scientists, uh, his name is Shen Kuo, and he was also a prominent official and a scholar. He once observed that the, uh, the deforestation in South China in Yanda Mountain, uh, which was a very gorgeous mountain in Wenzhou in Southeast China, uh, was, um, was very outstanding. It's a very popular tourist uh, site today. And I guess many of you in, in the audience, like me, probably visited Yanda Mountain before. But curiously, Nobody knew about this gorgeous mountain before the Song period, and why was that? And Shen Kuo gave his explanation. He said Yanda Mountain was not as tall as mountains nearby. So when nearby mountains were still densely wooded, it remained hidden from sight. However, when other mountains became treeless um, and became barren, Yanda Mountain emerged into view. And very specifically, Shen Kuo connected such a massive scale deforestation to a single construction project, the building of the Yuqing Temple in the early 11th century, as de uh, described in this quote on the slide. This massive construction project took place thousands of miles away from the Yanda Mountain in Kaifeng. Sorry. This massive temple had nearly 3,000 palaces and occupied an area as big as the entire Vatican City. I estimate this project required approximately 10 million pieces of locks, which were all transported from mountains in South China um, uh, or in Northwest China. And thousands of miles uh, separated Kaifeng and these mountains. Let me see if I can go back to here, yeah. Here on this eye circle, the Yanda Mountain, here in the blue circle, and the green patches uh, were the most heavily logged mountains. And consider the difficulty of long distance transportation between these mountains and Kaifeng. It's not hard to imagine that the actual number of timber consumption would only be higher because of the loss and damage rate of timber during the long distance transportation was really high. So the ensuing deforestation was significant. In this graph, we can see that during the Northern Song, the total forest area in South China decreased twice as fast as in previous dynasties. And in this period, the Song lost woodlands as large as the total area of England. Um, I know if I claim there is a causal relationship between this massive timber consumption in Kaifeng and the rapid decline of woodland in South China, you may say that I am a reductionist. So I will save myself from the disgrace of making such a casual or causal connection. But it is not me making this claim. It was actually Shen Kuo, a contemporary Song Dynasty scholar who reached this conclusion. And uh, 
that hyperconsumption led to landscape change, such as deforestation, and that alarmed him and also uh, alarmed his like-minded peers of unsustainability. Shen Kuo was not just a scientist uh, living in the ivory tower. He was also a very famous official and very active in politics of the Song government. He knew very well that wood was crucial. Uh, it was a very crucial natural resource for the economy and industry of the empire. But he also knew that wood was limited and he worried about the sustainability of woodlands, which were decreasing at a faster pace than ever. He had noticed it in Wenzhou, as, as shown in the previous quote, and also he noticed in other places he had traveled across the country, moving from one official post to the next. What amazed me was that Shen Kuo not only saw the crisis, but he also actively looked for solutions to mitigate the loss. He looked for alternative energy to replace wood in some industries. And what he found was amazing. He found a greasy liquid in Northwest China and named it Shiyo or stone oil, which is actually petroleum. And uh, the place where Shen Kuo found the petroleum actually became a major oil field in modern China. And that is the Yanchang oil field in Shanxi, uh, in Shanxi as the photo shows. Shen Kuo was very excited uh, when he found petroleum. He wrote that woodlands would deplete one day, but this mysterious greasy black oil from underground must be unlimited. And of course, we know this is not true based on our modern knowledge, but we are speaking from a vantage point that pre-modern people didn't have a thousand years ago. It is anachronistic to use uh, our modern knowledge to judge Shen Kuo as incorrect. What I see in Shen Kuo is a responsible citizen and a politician who deeply cared about the environment, but he also did not lose sight of economy. His attention to deforestation and his uh, search for alternative energy was pioneering in his time and also inspiring for us today. Um, since um, I think some of you, uh, if you're an environmental historian or uh, English historian, you probably know uh, Jevons uh, and the Cold Question. Jevons uh, experienced the Industrial Revolution which was powered by coal, and he worried about the sustainability of coal. He made the famous prediction of um, the exponential growth of future coal consumption. And to join this analogy with the Jevons coal question, I would like to call the concern of Shen Kuo and the other like-minded Song Dynasty scholar, uh, the Wood question. Jevons worried about the sustainability of coal, which powered the Industrial Revolution. And Shen Kuo worried about the sustainability of wood, which powered so many revolutionary changes in the Song Dynasty, um, including the commercial revolution, the agricultural revolution, and the early industrial revolution of China, which all heavily relied on wood. So I want to come back to um, okay, uh, I think this is okay, this is a wrong slide. Oh, no, no, this is correct slide, yeah. So I mentioned earlier that, you know, many scholars regard uh, the Song Dynasty, uh, in, in the West, view the Song Dynasty uh, in very favorable lights. So some call them the uh, commercial revolution of China, the early industrial revolution of China, and some call the Song Dynasty the, uh, the dawn of modernity uh, in China. So from the point of view of my research, the Song period marked the emergence of environmental modernity in China. What I mean is people in the Song dynasty a thousand years ago, they already developed awareness to environmental changes such as deforestation, and they connected these changes to human activities. They saw the large human footprint on nature, and they saw the crisis of scarcity, and they proactively looked for alternative solutions. And from the modern point of view, using petroleum to replace wood may seem like creating a new problem to solve an old problem, because now we know fossil fuel is uh, depletable, and we are using fossil energy way too much than we could. And now, instead of worrying about sustainability of wood, 
uh, people did a thousand years ago, we are worried about the sustainability of petroleum, especially nowadays. We all feel the pain of how vulnerable we can be when we rely so much on fossil fuel. And I think that is why it's so important that we must um, transition to alternative energies um, that are renewable and sustainable. I know in recent years, people must be very ambivalent about uh, alternative energy. Here in the United States, green energy has become somehow became a political issue. And I know last year, two years ago, people in some uh, states such as Texas experienced a real failure of their uh, uh, solar and wind, wind powered grids during severe winter storms. Solar and wind might be the solutions to replace fossil fuels, or they may not. But I think the key point here, uh, the key point here is their quest for sustainability had such old uh, roots in medieval China, and the same quest still goes on. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the fall of Kaifeng, uh, but I think we're probably uh, running out of time, and I want to save more time for questions. How about that, Ellen? Um, I think you can talk for another um, at least 10 minutes or so. Okay, if, okay. If you, uh, you know, if you want. So... Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. So, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, Kaifeng, uh, the fall of Kaifeng. So, Kaifeng, I yeah, I want to show you this picture, but I realize this is not very uh, clear. I will show. Yeah. So, this is a picture of uh, a Southern Song painting depicting the flea of uh, Zhao Go, which was the first emperor of uh, uh, Southern Song. How he fled um, Kaifeng and how. Uh, the Yellow River was frozen, and um, the uh, the Jurchen the Jurchen army chasing him uh, was also attempting to cross in the Yellow River. And the end of Kaifeng um, uh, really ended with um, with the Yellow with the Yellow River. So the city was captured by go back to this was captured by the Jurchen in 1127. And uh, as the, the painting before showed, the Song court relocated to South China uh, with Zhao Go, who became the new emperor. But some Song, Song loyalists, they still stayed in North China uh, to continue fighting the Jurchens. And their leader, Zhu, uh, Du Chong, made a fatal decision in 1128. And he decided to breach the Yellow River Dike, and hoping to use the water to attack the Jurchen-occupied Kaifeng. And it's not hard to imagine what happened after this breach. This was not the first time that people decided to flood Kaifeng with um, Yellow River waters. It happened in the Warren States and it ha happened in the Sino-Japanese War. In 1938, Chiang Kai-shek did the same uh, thing as Du Chong did 800 years ago. He ordered the nationalist soldiers to breach the Yellow River Dike at Huayuanko to attack the Japan-occupied Kaifeng. And the man-made flood didn't drive out the Japanese, but killed 900,000 Chinese civilians and displaced millions. And um, there were also... And there are also many uh, environmental ramifications instead of, you know, those deaths and the refugees. And for one, uh, as this Times article reported, the displaced refugees from the flooded areas uh, spread a uh, uh, disease to Shanghai, the most cosmopolitan place. And uh, the Yellow River uh, uh, strategy failed in 1938, and so did Du Chong's Yellow River uh, strategy in 1128. The Jurchens continued to reign over North China, but Kaifeng was uh, submerged. With the same event repeating itself over and over again in history, Kaifeng ends up being the site, uh, site of cities on top of cities. Uh, archaeologists have found that there were six Kaifeng cities constructed during different dynasties, from the Warren States to the Qing Dynasty, bearing under the present day Kaifeng, one on top of each other. So in addition to submerging the city, those made floods by weaponizing the Yellow River also change the river courses. The Bian Canal, uh, the artery connecting Kaifeng with South China was destroyed. Sands from the Yellow River were deposited in such great amount that the channel was almost completely filled up. 
The Bian Canal only has a very tiny vestige today after the 1128 flood. Um, the remnant of the Song period canal became a small section of the Yellow River's new course and is now located around uh, six miles north of modern Kaifeng in Liu Yuanhou. And what modern visitors can see is this unusual side of uh, Xuanhe or Hanging River um, the, because the riverbed is already as high as um, more than th 30 feet above the ground level. Um, so that is the end of Kaifeng, that is the end of Kaifeng's prosper uh, prosperity. Um, I have been thinking about this question, why did Kaifeng decline? And I have read many books uh, in Chinese and English and Japanese, and I've seen people offering different uh, answers to that question. So one of the books I read uh, very recently, a Chinese book, the author said Kaifeng declined because the government didn't uh, supply Kaifeng with enough support. And he cited the examples of, you know, maybe um, in the early years of PRC, uh, when Kaifeng was still a candidate for the uh, uh, for the provincial capital. So there were still enough resources flooding into Kaifeng to sustain the city. But after the government support withdrew, the city declined rapidly. So the other argued that Kaifeng didn't, um, didn't uh, retain its prosperity because the government didn't continue to pump money into it. But I think the otherwise. I think if a city's prosperity has to be sustained by artificially pumping money by the government or other resources into the city, it is not sustainable. If Kaifeng was able to maintain all, uh, all of those connections that it had before, such as the canal, such as the highways, I guess it would be much um, easier for this uh, for uh, resource and uh, and the capital and also uh, manpower to flood into the city to build the city. But without those connections, everything was just hard. And now, because of you know um, the clogged river, the hanging river, as I'm showing you on this uh, on this photo on the slide now, Kaifeng is a backward city in North China. So the last time I checked, you know, there is a tier system in China. Kaifeng is a tier three or tier four city. I don't see there is any, um, any pros a prospect uh, within sight for the for the for the city to rise back to its uh, status one thousand years ago as uh, as the Manhattan of uh, at the medieval Manhattan. So I th that is my answer to the question. So I think it's really the ecological. It's really the ecological consequence of uh, of the city's rise and the decline that is spelled the long term decline of the city. Yeah. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen, for such a fascinating and informative uh, talk. And uh, so I just wanted to. Um, tell the audience that if you have questions, please type into the Q&A section and I'll read them to, uh, to Dr. Chen. And I have multiple questions, but uh, uh, we've got five questions lined up already. So I'm going to read um, the questions uh, sequentially for you, so for you to answer um, them live, okay? Yes. Okay, so our first question uh, from an anonymous attendee is that, can you talk about Kaifeng on the Silk Road and the Jewish community there? Sure, I'd love to. So the, the Jews in Kaifeng, the Jews in Kaifeng were first discovered by uh, Father Matteo Ricci in the, um, in, in, the, in the Ming Dynasty. So it's, it's a long story about the Kaifeng Jews, but it's a fascinating. So the, the um, you know, so there is a Chinese man, his name is Ai Tian, and he heard, that you know, there's somebody from the capital city. There is a foreigner in capital city, and um, they worship one god, a single god. So he was very excited and asked people to introduce him to Father Ricci, and uh, and because you know he thought that you know this must be um, a, a rabbi instead of um, in, instead of a, a, a Christian. A, and um, so he saw um, Matteo Ricci. And uh, Matteo Ricci asked him to bow to uh, Maria and the, and the sculpture of Maria and the Jesus. He was surprised 
but he still bowed. And uh, then uh, Father Ricci introduced him to see um, the some of the some of the twelve disciples, and he thought those were some uh, four, I think, four sculptures of the twelve disciples. And he thought, oh, this must be four of the twelve Jewish tribes. So there are uh, quite some misunderstandings back and forth, and then they figure out, okay, so you're not Christian, uh, so you're Christians, and you're Jews. We do we do not really belong. But they were still very excited to find each other. So from this point on, Father Maturici introduced to the West that hey, there is this um, uh, community of Jewish people in Kaifeng. And how could this be? So people started to trace their origins. So the um, the earliest extent stele they can found uh, in Kaifeng, I think it's from the Ming Dynasty. And in the Ming Dynasty, uh, in this Ming Dynasty stele, it recorded that they first came to settle in Kaifeng during the Northern Song. And uh, in the Jing Dynasty, they were allowed to build their first uh, synagogue in Kaifeng. So these people, you know, they were giving, uh, they were given Chinese names and uh, they married uh, Chinese women. They adopted a lot of Chinese, they adopted a lot of, you know, Chinese customs. They um, adapted their praise, adapted their theology to fit the Chinese uh, custom, but they still uh, retained a very distinct Jewish identity. Uh, and this group of people, they are actually on the verge of distinction. They're really struggling on their last leg in China right now because um, obviously you guys know the, the religious crackdown in China. In for, um, for a good decades of time, they were able to receive they were able to receive, you know, help from um, from the Jewish community from overseas. Uh, you know, they uh, they they learned Hebrew. They were, you know, um, uh, the rabbis were sent to the, there to build schools to teach them. They they also celebrate the Jewish holidays. But now everything is uh, is declining, and their synagogue was also demolished. So this is something, this is a diminishing, uh, vanishing community in China right now. I hope they can be preserved. But yes, their arrival in China, I'm sorry, this is a little bit diverting, but their arrival in China uh, happened during the Song Dynasty. Uh, the Silk Road, there are two theories. And um, one theory is that they traveled by the overland route, um, the, the so-called Silk Roads. But another a uh, school of uh, scholars think that they probably travel uh, by maritime routes. And uh, in addition to the Jewish communities in Kaifeng, there are also some Jewish communities uh, on the coast. Um, I forgot which cities, probably Quanzhou had a Jewish community as well. Uh, and there are also other Jewish communities, but those Jewish communities, they were dismantled um, during the Ming dynasty uh, when, you know, the Ming, uh, Ming Haijing, uh, when they tried to drove out most of the foreigners. So some of the Jews left and some of the Jews actually fled to Kaifeng and settled there. So Kaifeng is the, the only Jewish, uh, known Jewish community in China. Um, nowadays, yeah. So that's what I know about uh, the uh, the Chinese Jews in Kaifeng. There is an edited uh, volume just called the Chinese Jews in Kaifeng. If you're interested, um, there are many good articles in there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the answer, Dr. Chen. Uh, our next question also comes from um, an anonymous attendee. So the question is: Are you in dialogue with uh, Mika? Mascolino about environmental degradation in Northwest China. Of course, we were uh, we were on the same. Yeah, uh, we were on the same Yellow River panel on AAS. I think last year or two years ago, and uh, um, he uh, he's participating in the uh, in the hydrological workshop at Duke. We are going to see each other again in February uh, in April. Yeah. Okay, so lots of questions. It's, it's hard for me to keep up, actually. The next question uh, comes from my uh, colleague, Joseph Sealy, who is a modern Korean, uh, modern Korean historian. And he said, thank you for your fascinating presentation. Quick note, the Korean kingdom that existed during the Song period was, co was called Gil, not Kogolil, uh, spell, uh, spell uh, Kogolil on slide maps. 
uh, Kalkaliu fell by the late seventh century. I also wanted to ask the methodology for assessing historical forest cover in China as reflected in the graph you shared. Are these extrapolations obtained from local gazetteers or other types of sources? Actually, I have this. I have the same question. So, um, uh, I I got the data. I mean, I did a graph myself, but I got the data from um, from a Chinese article. Uh, I, I can send that uh, the original source to you. But um, so it says that I'm I'm relying on whatever that's per. Uh, I'm relying on the data provided in that paper. It says it's based on some survey. Yeah, but uh, I, I draw the data from a Chinese article. Okay, thank you. And the next question comes from my student, uh, Carvin Fetgata. Did water power technology have a role in Song Life? Kaifeng's canals are an example, but I wonder if there was something like the mills in Europe at the time. Um, I remember in, in some of the Gengzhi Tu, they had um, they had those shui chua, maybe not as you know as grand as those European windmills, but uh, yeah, it's a different function. But they had some kind of shui chua in, in their agricultural activities. Yeah, yeah. Actually, by the southern zone, I think the technology uh, had become pretty um, sophisticated. And Calvin, I could uh, I could show you uh, an image of uh, that in the water. Um, what uh what is called uh water uh what water, water pump right water pumping machine or something like that okay so um the next question comes from my student uh Blanche uh Dilro. is Kaifeng still organized in a similar way today i.e like in uh, Manhattan I don't quite get the question I mean I, I just mentioned that uh, Kaifeng Northern Song Kaifeng has submerged I mean in terms of the city it has been submerged by Yellow River. So the when you go to Kaifeng today, you're standing on top of the Song Dynasty Kaifeng. So it's a brand new city. It's brand new cities over and over again for six times. And uh, uh, in terms of city design, no, it's very different. But I know that you know they are um, doing a lot of a lot of archaeological work trying to excavate the past. Uh, uh, that the historical cities, and I think there is a recent um, uh, archaeological excavation just uh, several weeks or several months ago. They found, uh, uh, Ellen, did you see the news? They found some, you know, Northern Song, uh, the bridge, mm -hmm. which, uh, with, with, you know, with, with a steely. So, yeah, I think people, in terms of our archaeology, people are trying to um, discover, trying to uh, recover this uh, the Song city, and in terms of city planning, it's very different. And uh, organization, government organization, definitely different now. It's a different regime. <laughs> so I, I don't quite get, I mean, maybe he can uh, elaborate a little bit. What does he mean in this question? Uh, or no, I can- if, if I understand it cor kind of correctly, I assume that, you know, she, you know, she was asking about, you know, the way the city was planned or you know, laid out or something like that. It's completely different. Right, yeah. yes, it, no, it's, it, no, it's underground already, okay. So our next question from uh, Anika Narayanan, uh, my student also. In addition to lamb consumption, the resulting scar scarcity and the deforestation, what were some other aspects of society that had major ecological impacts in various geographical locations? So uh, when you deal with the pre-modern sources, I think my biggest challenge is how can you connect the consumption uh, with um, the degradation. So I, I'm very careful to make those claims. Uh, so, I mean, if there are any ways for me to quantify, I will try my, uh, try my best to quantify, such as, you know, the examples I gave you um, to sustain this much of trade, you have to dedicate this much of grasslands. So I'm very careful to go into those numbers to make sure I know what I'm talking about. But most of the time, I do not have those figures for me to fully evaluate the uh, ecological impact. That's why I really rely on, I, I really rely on the quotes of contemporary people. 
So instead of me saying that, hey, this deforest uh, this construction caused the deforestation, I'm very interested in, hey, I found that Shen Kuo said this construction led to that deforestation because that is contemporary people's observation. And obviously, you know, uh, as the uh, the slide shows, uh, I can also find some uh, some modern evidence based on non-historical method, based on scientific method to do the survey of you know past the forest uh, coverage. So I can come up with this uh, graph to confirm what Shen Kuo said. But uh, I just want to say that overall, when we want to evaluate environment degradation or environment impact based on pre-modern data, it's very precarious. And uh, I don't want to draw any precarious conclusion. So uh, some of the other studies I've done, um, so uh, Alan knows I've also studied the seafood. Um, and uh, so for seafood, it's very tough to evaluate how much, whether it really led to the distinction of uh, uh, extinction of certain uh, species or, uh, or dramatic population uh, reduction of certain species. But what I can find in contemporary some sources was that people already noticed there was um, significant economic impact uh, from the consumption of Kaifeng and the economy of those uh, port cities that it relied on fishing. So um, the, the, those fishing villages, you know, there were, there were poor villages, but after the, uh, after the uh, Northern Song built the capital in Kaifeng and when all those transportation network uh, was started, you know, were, were put into, into use and the Northern people started to consume large quantities of seafood and demand from those fishing villages suddenly spiked. So some of the fishermen, they start to make as much money as the as the peasants, and uh, you know, and that even happened in Jiangnan, uh, where you know peasants were like you know the, the most productive agricultural regions. Peasants were like richer than other peasants in, uh, in other provinces. So you can see that you know the consumption is giving some direct um, uh, kick on the economy far far uh, away, um, and there are some. And there's some other uh, uh, cases I can find. For example, I found that you know um, the Song people actually from the same region I was just talking about. They send alligators to Kaifeng as part of their gong as their tribute, and it's like a regular amount of um, alligators, and that's for food. And uh, and that's the yangzi, uh, the Chinese alligator. And we know this is um, uh, endangered species today. But how much connection can we draw from um, you know the Song people's consumption of the Chinese alligator to the uh, status endangered status of the Chinese alligator today? I'm still very suspicious. But I just want to present this as some of the evidence. But I think you know overall when we are studying environment a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, and um, uh, and what we can actually observe is today, I think, you know, drawing the, such conclusion is very dangerous. So I very, uh, I very much rely on contemporary people's judgment, such as the, the, the Shen Kui example I found. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, next question is from my student, uh, Zhou Ruiyang. Since Kaifeng is so important from a st strategic point of view, if Kaifeng is occupied by the enemy, will it have a fatal impact on the economy of the Song Dynasty? Did the Song Dynasty government ever have a dispute uh, or debate that the capital was so far, so far north near enemies rather than south? That's a very good question. And uh, that actually goes back to uh, what I want to say in the end. So I think, you know, it's interesting for us to think about that even though the Song Dynasty lost half of its territory, geographical territory, and relocated to South China, Southern Song was very prosperous. Southern Song, I mean, even though the country, you know, lost half of its territory, I don't think, you know, as a government, the Southern Song lost any of its, uh, its government revenue. And as a society, South China continued to prosper. And, you know, even after the Southern Song, even it was, you know, um, conquered by the Yuan, when Marco Polo came to Hangzhou, Marco Polo was amazed by the prosperity of Hangzhou. 
So I think in my view, I haven't really written this in the book yet, and this is my plan, I'm going to write it. In my view, Kaifeng was really an unnatural capital. It was, it was built, it prospered in a very, uh, on, uh, a very modern way by drawing uh, you know, remote resources, by drawing distant resources from all of those faraway places. And uh, thanks to the uh, transportation technology um, at that time, it was able to do that, but it's still a lot of effort. But Hangzhou of South China at that time was a very natural port. It, yes, it also had uh, it also had canals, but it's mainly to um, to ship the things from Hangzhou to elsewhere. And Hangzhou, you know, it's 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 maritime ports. It was already receiving all kinds of foreign goods at the time, uh, even 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 before the northern zone, before the southern zone, it was already you know one of the trading ports. So when the population has already been concentrated in the South, when people have been, you know, I mentioned uh, after the Anlushan Rebellion, after the fall of Tang, uh, the, you know, the population, they just uh, moved to um, massively migrated to South China. South China already became the population and economic center of China, but for reasons such as legitimacy, for reasons such as a tradition, People still insisted to build the capital in North China because that's China proper, because that's Zhongyuan. But building a capital in South China already made a lot of economic sense. And uh, uh, did the Song Dynasty government ever had this view that, that the capital was so far north near enemies rather than south? Uh, capital, so far north. You mean that... Uh, you mean that they think the capital should be relocated to the south, even during the northern Song period? If that's maybe, the, if, maybe if, if it's in the farther south, then even I, farther I, south. No, that's my understanding of the question. Okay, okay, okay. okay. No, no. I mean, even Kaifeng was like a compromise, uh, as I mentioned. You know, all kinds of uh, legitimacy arguments. They wanted to go back to Chang'an, even though Chang'an was almost impossible at the time. And so that okay, if we cannot go back to Chang'an, at least let's go back to Luoyang. So Luoyang was actually one of the capitals. Uh, of uh, of the song, so we know, you know, we always always say that um, uh, Kaifeng is Dongjing, the eastern capital, and that because there is a western capital, Xijing, and that is Luoyang. So the song still, the northern song still kept a lot of its um, ritual architecture, you know, lot, uh, such as the temples in uh, in Luoyang. So Luoyang still functioned as a capital in some of the ways. And so there is a Japanese scholar, and he called Luoyang. Um, the sacred capital and uh, Kaifeng, the secular capital of the Song dynasty. But no, nobody thought of uh, relocating to the South. I think at one point, um, you know, uh, during Zhen Zong's reign, when the Liao attacked, they were thinking about relocating, you know, those um, those consuls in, in the court. They were, and they were, <laughs> I think they were, um, they were just they 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 were suggesting the emperor to relocate the court, but I think they each suggested the emperor to relocate the, to their hometowns. So there was a, quite a fight in the court. I remember. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think there was um, a permanent uh, decision to. I mean, even in Kaifeng was not a permanent decision. It was meant to be contemporary, but you know they stayed there. It was so convenient that left, they never left. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And the next question is from my colleague, uh, Frederick Damon from Anthropology. Was the movement of sheep for, from, you know, for example, Xixia to Kaifeng consider, um, so, Fr so Fred, I have, uh, no, I think there's a typo, Zan uh, Yang or Gongping, Gongping, well, that's tributes, but I, I'm i not sure what the first uh, term means. And uh, the Chinese characters, um, I no, I don't follow. Could you please explain your question a bit uh, in the Q and A, and I'll read uh, I'll read it again uh, next. So let's move on to the next question uh, from uh, Hao Yu Cheng. I was wondering about the connection and difference between uh, Jervan and Shen and Shen Kuo. Can you explain that again? Jervan and Shen Kuo. I'm here. 
So Jevons, he lived through the Industrial Revolution in England, and he saw that you know um, this revolution, Industrial Revolution, was heavily relying on coal. But he already saw that you know the coal consumption was growing exponentially. So he wrote this book, The Coal Question. And that is to argue for the unsustainability of the industrial revolution. And he, the basic um, point is that you know we only have this limited uh, supply of coal and and see how much we rely on them. And its growth is exponentially uh, growing. And uh, so when we are running out of coal, how are we going to continue to power this uh, this uh, this this revolution? And so that is a coal question. So for Shen Kuo. Uh, my understanding, the reason I draw this analogy, because I see Shen Kuo asking the same question. We are using wood so much, and in his mind, woodland is depletable. So, but you know, we need wood. We need wood to build those uh, palaces. We need wood uh, to build these wood blocks. We need wood to build these ships. So, without uh, without wood, what can we do for the economy? But wood is limited. So this is the wood question uh, that I'm trying to present, which I think is very similar to the coal question of Jevons. I don't know if I explain myself well. Thank you for the explanation. Uh, so next question uh, from Andy Xu, my student. If Shen Kuo found stone oil so early, why didn't it? Uh, why wasn't it developed uh, or utilized in so in the Qing Dynasty or the early period of modern China? Well, so Shen Kuo discovered the petroleum. Uh, it, it's not really discovered by him. Actually, local people, I think maybe as early as the Han Dynasty, people already found that, you know, there's this very greasy oil. And I think local people use this to light up their lamps and found, you know, this is actually the lamp can last much longer if we use this very greasy oil in my lamp. And uh, even Shen Kuo, when he found the petroleum, he didn't find the shiyo, He didn't really think of using this, um, uh, you know, um, for energy. He was he was thinking of using this to make ink, because ink also, you know, um, was very uh, was was also you know very. Um, um, uh, um, I think he, I think in the Song Dynasty. Uh, they most relied on pine wood to make ink. And Shen Kuo, he once passed Shandong uh, and another province, and he said uh, those um, pine forests, uh, they were gone. And why? Because they were all uh, deforested. They were all locked to make uh, ink. So he was thinking of using of using uh, of using the petroleum of the shiyo as a, a source to replace uh, the pine wood that has been so heavily logged for ink. He wasn't really thinking about to massively use this for uh, for energy. And uh, you know why wasn't this industrialized? This is a good question. And Shen Kuo, if you read his Mengxi Bi Tan, he found so many things. And in none of the things you know were like massively were massively produced. He um, he reportedly you know he was the first one who uh, recorded the Bisheng's uh, uh, Bisheng's invention of the movable movable type. It was not really used in China. It's just that single mention. And um, but you know to think it this way, I, I was um, reading something else the the other uh, the other day. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci he wrote so many things during the Renaissance period. And how many of you know his amazing notebooks, how many of those things like airplanes in his notebooks were actually um, put into production right away? No. So there is always the, there is a, there's a gap between those genius mind and uh, the final production. Sometimes it takes uh, centuries, sometimes it takes uh, uh, millennia. Okay, thank you. And 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 Fred uh, wrote um, and explained. So this is his question: A dictionary translated tribute as zanyang and gongpin are either of these terms the ways by which the sheep to kaifeng ex exchange was conceived? Was it tribute? I don't know what is zanyang. Yeah, I I don't either. The, um, 
they, well, tribute, the tribute uh, trade, it's, it's an economy, the tribute economy, um, depending on how you, so when, when we say tribute, I know, you know, when I teach class, when I say tribute, Chao Gong, a lot of uh, students think about, you know, there's the Qing, uh, Qing dynasty image of Wan Guo Lai Chao Tu, of, you know, those people from, uh, from different Mongol tribes and also Russia carrying all kinds of fancy goods and waiting for Emperor Qianlong to be received. Yes, that is one type of Gong. But if you check all the gazetteers, all the counties, all the prefectures, they also send their own Gong. So it's just some products they send to the central government. And uh, as for the sheep trade, it was not a gong. It was demanded very regularly. And um, so for, okay, so let me put it this way. So for gong is a bartering economy, but a very different kind of bartering economy. It's like, I give you something and in reward, the Chinese emperor will give me something else. And that usually that's something more valuable. That's why it's a trade. But for the sheep trade with Xixia, I don't think you can say this as a gong in that sense, because you know, there it's priced. There is a clearly labeled price and there is a quota. And especially, you know, before the festivals, before the New Year's, before the Empress' birthday, before the uh, Empress, uh, Empress Dowager's birthdays, you have to make sure that you go to the sheep markets in uh, on the Xixia border, on the Liao border to make sure that you have enough uh, sheep purchase. Mm -hmm. So these are like labeled purchases. So in this way, I don't think they are gong. But if you think of gong as widely encompassing all the trade with foreign countries, yeah, maybe. But I don't know what is Zanyang. Yeah, me either. Um, okay, thank you. So the next question, could you expand more on the idea that six cities were built on top of each other? How would the people have uh, adapted to such issues? Okay. This is a model of uh, how it was built on top of each other. They they just get used to it. I mean, when it was, I mean, Yellow River, you can see how sedimented it is. So if you know the city, if half of the city was buried by the sand, it doesn't make sense to just, you know, remove all the sands, especially if you expect another flood will come sometime in the future, unpredictable, unpredictable future. So they, they just chose to build on top of each other. Um, what I heard is like, it's a six and a half cities, which I don't really understand how does the half mean? Cause I haven't been to the site. I really want to, but now I can't. Um, but yeah, that's what I read from the archeological reports. That's, you know, one city built on top of each other. So um, the, the top one is the Qing dynasty and the Ming dynasty and the Jing Northern Song. And uh, then there is the Tang, and then the Warren states. Yeah, that it, that's a six, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, my colleague, uh, Fred Damon, again, you know, uh, he, um, he just offered a comment. With climate scientists, I've occasionally asked if the global warming period between roughly 900 and uh, 1250 could be anthropogenic. I'm aware of the ceramics industry across Southeast, southeastern China. Um, your marvelous picture suggests yes for the rest of the Song Dynasty area. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, next question from John Smith, my student. Was Kaifeng the dominant production center of the Song? It clearly demanded resources and commodities, but was it responsible for large-scale production of finished goods, uh, such as you know, ironwork, coinage, wagons, barges, you know, chariots? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, that's it? No. Okay. Hangzhou, Hangzhou was. Later, Hangzhou was, but Kaifeng, no. Okay, um, next question from Grace Driver, my student. How were there ways Kaifeng was set up to help with things like public health and plague? Oh, that's a good question. So consider the massive population, obviously the the government needs to build up something. So, you know, um, so for example, so for the extreme winter, which actually happened quite a lot, 
during the during the northern song the government actually they set up um a stockpile a stock of pile of uh, either firewood or coal or combination of both so in extreme winters you know when the firewood and coal very expensive they will distribute things from this uh, their stockpile either uh, you know for free provide them to the poor or you know to sell them at a very low price in order to regulate the, the market price it can help a little bit but how much i'm not sure but what i know is that the government has such a stockpile of um uh, of fire of firewood and um uh and the coal in storage to help the poor in uh, in times of uh, uh in times of a uh, severe winter and um uh in terms of plague um i I know that you know. Uh, in times, actually, that happened. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm writing about a new chapter on on disease and the plague in Kaifeng. It actually happened quite a lot. So one of the, so you know they try. I mean, obviously there are immediate ways. You know, when that happens, they set up um, the 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 they, they set up those uh, places to do uh, to uh, to distribute the. Um, the Zhong Yao, the, the Chinese medicine, and also send like the palace doctors to the people to treat them in extreme cases. Um, but they also, for example, you know, I, I remember one source, it says that um, the reason for plague is because of, um, not the reason, just one of the reasons for plague um, is because of um, uh, heat, is a rue. And then, okay, so how about we plant more trees in the city in order to regulate the temperature so that uh, in the summer, it, um, uh, you know, it, it can uh, lower the temperature and also prevent, uh, prevent E from the disease or plague from spreading. So they planted trees. Uh, obviously, the, uh, it's not the only motivation for them to plant trees. They plant trees for a, a, an array of other reasons. Um, but you can see that disease control was really in their mind when they when they set up certain public policies. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And a quick question from uh, someone anonymous. What was the name of the book on the Jewish community in Kaifeng again? Oh, just the Chinese Jews in Kaifeng. Okay. So yeah. from my, uh, my student, Kellen O'Donnell. Uh, you mentioned a few different sources about awareness and proactive thought about ecological consequences of Kaifeng's economical demands. You also addressed that many people weren't possibly aware of the consequences of their consumption. Have you found many other sources such, uh, of such progressive thinking, potentially groups or larger publications or other suggestions of alternative energies? No. No. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Uh, short answer. Um, okay, so from Elizabeth uh, Brotherton um, to, uh, oh, to, uh, so that's a question. No, well, she was, yeah, she was answering, yeah, she was answering uh, Carmen's question. So from my student, Jacob Neal, since the song had innovative shipbuilding, was there increased sea travel to other parts of the world? Uh, increased sea travel to other parts of the world. Uh, Yes, I think you know maritime trade uh, in in the Song has been has been definitely increasing. Uh, so in terms of maritime trade, I do not know too much about Northern Song, but in the Southern Song, you know, you guys know about the Zhu Fan Zhi by Zhao Rugua. So that is definitely very um, extensive account of you know uh, places um, in South Asia, Southeast Asia, very far away. Um, I'm not aware of such uh, a similar book in the Northern Song, but yeah, but I think overall maritime in, in, in the Song has been increasing. So there, there were uh, three main maritime trading ports, Quanzhou, Guangzhou, and uh, Hangzhou. So I think, you know, that's why Hangzhou was already one of the major maritime trading ports and it was really natural for Hangzhou to take over as the, the next capital of China and it became a really good one. Okay, thank you. A uh, question from Peter Hook. Uh, can you say more about the species of the special wood that was used to build the tower ships? What were the qualities of that wood that led the Kaifeng Corp to have it imported? Uh, it's called a Nanmu. 
Uh, it's uh, only native to South China and not even to uh, to other countries. Uh, so Nan Mu Mu Zibian Nan Bian and Nan, and um, so it was. Um, if you go to Beijing uh, nowadays, I think you know one of the Ming Dynasty temple. It was made uh, using. Uh, it was made using Jing Si Nan Mu. It was very expensive, but it's very durable, very sturdy, and waterproof. Uh, so the Song Dynasty people, they so in Kaifeng, in Kaifeng there was nothing, but they were they managed to build everything man-made. So there was no lake, and uh, they they built a lake. And the purpose of the lake, the Jingming Shi, the Jingming Lake, uh, in the initial purpose of building this lake was for the naval drills because you know they were still trying to train their navy. But when the dynasty started to, you know, be, become really tired of war and uh, they they abandoned the naval drill, but in the, instead they started to have those uh, boat races in this lake. And on this lake, um, they first have this grand dragon ship or tower ship, and uh, and that is built, made of Nan Mu. And uh, it really caused a sensation in the court and everybody went to the to, uh, uh, went to went to the lake to see to see the ship, and it was uh, made of Namu, and I think it was Namu from Hunan Prefecture. It was Hunan Province today. It was uh, Jingnan Prefecture at the time, and uh, yeah, so that's the first time the people in North China has ever seen that wood. So it's um, actually uh, it's also understandable. I, I only showed the map of where the trees came from. But if you see another map, which I also made of where the shipyards were, they actually overlap. So you can hardly say that which one drove the other. So if they found that this wood is superior for shipbuilding, it's usually also good for construction. So, you know, so they can use this for construction. So if they found this certain wood species is very ideal for construction, the shipyards are like, hey, maybe we can use this for uh, building ships. So, you know, the shipyards start to expand. So, so, you know, in this period, we can see a lot of introduction of tree spaces from North China, so from, sorry, from South China into North, and then we can also see the expansion of shipyards in South China because of this, you know, mutually um, feedback system. Okay, thank you. Those were twenty questions, <laughs> really, really good. And I think we have we have enough time for me to ask at least one question. Um, okay, so my question is: We're all um, aware of, say, the demand for fire uh, for fire uh, wood um, in the capital city, and then the use of a coal. Um, I have always been wondering about, you know, the affordability uh, issue. So you have a city of 1.5 million, and so nowadays, you know, uh, winter is coming. We talk we talked about energy prices and uh, and people basically struggling to uh, either pay their energy bills or gas money or food or so. In the city of 1.5 million, have have you have you um, come across sources that? touch on you know the issue of affordability that you know say so many people um basically cannot afford to to you know to to cook or to heat or um you know just you know just some something in that uh area yes. sure 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 yes um so uh out of the 1.5 million people about more than half 800,000 of them were soldiers and their families so the government has an obligation to feed them and heat them up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and this, uh, this was actually the reason for them to, uh, to build the, the, the capital in Kaifeng because, you know, they need to, they need to feed such, uh, such a substantial army, 800,000 plus, uh, 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 that's including their family. So, uh, for so for at least you know half of the population in the city, the government is obliged to provide for them, and for the rest of the population, and obviously you know it's very stratified. Obviously, there is uh, the hero family. Obviously, there are the high officials, 
and uh, there were poor people, a lot of poor people. So the population of 1.5 million and Manhattan's population 1.6 million, they have the same area. And I think about those, those high rises in Manhattan and I think about those at most two story houses in the Song Dynasty with the Yang Qingming, Qingming scroll and most of them just one story. So how do those people live? It must be very, so for the poor, it must be very bad living condition. So I really don't imagine that the poor in Kaifeng, they can have a very decent uh, lifestyle uh, in, such an, in such an expensive city. Um, you know, in, um, in, in Dongjing Menghua Lu, in, there are a lot of, um, there, there, are, there are a lot of sources about the prices of things, you know, like the price of wine. And you can see that if you're a high official, obviously you can afford to have those wine. But if you are just like a low ranking, um, low ranking officer uh, in, in, in a local government office, your, your one month salary could probably only buy you a cup of wine. So no, not a lot of people can afford um, all kinds of uh, all kinds of the luxuries. So all kinds of those luxuries coming into Kaifeng, they they were not evenly distributed. So for example, for lamb, I mentioned uh, there's a Japanese scholar and he made um, um, he he made a chart of you know who consumed the most of the lamb. So most of the lambs were consumed by the officials because you know the, they they were able to. They were able to, the, the, the uh, lamb was paid to them as salary in kind. So they were, afford, they were able to afford lamb and um, the rest of the population, they like lamb, but they cannot afford as much as the officials. And uh, so do coals and the firewood. Firewood, maybe that's more accessible, but for coal, um, I think the court transports coal from Shanxi, which is still a coal um, powerhouse in China right now, still, you know, exports coal to the rest of China and maybe elsewhere. Um, but yeah, so from, at least from the Song Dynasty, Shanxi started to ship coal to the government, to the central government, um, the, the, the royal family and the high officials, the really rich ones, they were able to use coal for heating, but the poor ones, firewood from nearby hills, nearby mountains, and uh, most of them, such as I just mentioned in the uh, in the relief case in winter, mo most of them, they, they die in severe winters because they couldn't have enough heating. And that's why the government was also aware that, okay, so we have to have a stockpile of those necessities to distribute to people in winter, either for free or at low price. But um, yeah, but not but not everybody was uh, created equal in the Song in the Song Dynasty. Okay, thank you. One last question just came in, so let's uh, let's uh, let's answer this question and then um, and that's it. So uh, this is from Haley Fitch, my uh, student. Were there others in Song China or in other dynasties who noticed the negative effects or co of consumption on ecologies and tried to suggest other options? Others in Song China, other dynasties. Uh, so another another example I have um, cited was a uh, was a Su Shi. So Su Shi was also um, a very prominent scholar. Also traveled a lot, and uh, also you know very attentive to all, all kinds of um, social affairs and uh, social ills. And he once visited. Um, I can say an arsenal. He wants this in an arsenal, and uh, he saw that they were making swords using coal instead. You know, uh, using coal instead of um, instead of a wood uh, to to burn the furnace. And he was very excited, and he think, okay, so this will save the forest. And obviously he doesn't really understand the ecological consequence of coal, but I think it's probably Shen Kuo and Su Shi, I guess they're probably not singular in their time to realize wood was limited and wood was also um, being consumed at um, a faster speed than anybody would wish to see. Um, actually, there is another example that just occurred to me, Ouyang Xiu. He once 
uh, wrote to the emperor, uh, memorialized to the emperor that because the uh, the emperor wanted to uh, to do some renovation work in some of the palaces, and he said these uh, these were the uh, the the resources needed to fix some of the palaces we still haven't been fixing. Uh, from last year and see this is how much wood that's required and he said at this speed if we are to fix everything demanded by the palace if all the uh, arable lands in the empire obviously he was exaggerating he said if all the arable lands or if all the fertile lands in the empire were used to grow woods there would not be enough to sustain such a usage so it's not one person, at least, you know, I think of three people, they have this, uh, they have this uh, uh, type of thinking. So I think it's actually, it's definitely visible, uh, the consumption and the degradation, the cost was definitely visible to, to not just a small group of people. Yeah. Thank you. It's 4.32 and uh, so, I guess, you know, let's uh, thank Dr. Chen for a great talk and uh, for answering all these questions. And uh, and thanks everybody for joining us and have a good weekend. So bye, thank you. Thank you.